Well, why don't we get started? My name is Steve Pyatt, and I hope to energize you a bit today. That's my only pun, I promise. <laughs> but more, more importantly, you're here because you want to learn something about energy. Perhaps I'll be able to give you some ideas of things you and your family can do on the energy subject. And most importantly, how many of you have children or grandchildren who are convinced they know more about the subject of energy than you do? And they like to lecture you about it. Why is it energy? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Two points. <laughs> Two points. <clears throat> Let's start off. Why is energy important? <laughs> Can't live without it. Limited resources. Limited resources. If you don't, if you want lights in your house, Feynman says it makes everything move. Feynman makes everything move. All of the above. One of the ways I like to think of it is: imagine you're on a camping trip. Only it's not just for a weekend. It goes forever. Yes, including this thing we call winter. And oh, by the way, all those things made in our society, because we have energy, things like sleeping bags, toss them, tents, toss them, prepackaged meals, toss them, lanterns, toss them, flashlights, toss them. That's a world without energy. The direct TV settlers. That's even worse than them because they do have electricity. My wife and I were in India last November. The Indian government knows that energy is so important that they have been massively electrifying the country. Even shacks <coughs> where you don't imagine someone's living, you see power lines. And quite a few of them have satellite dishes. So you want to be thankful that the people who came before us gave us energy options. Now, we're going to focus on Idaho today. Let me tell you a few more, a few words about why you might want to listen to me. I've got all kinds of degrees. I've written book chapters, journal articles, been in energy programs at the lab for 31 years, been retired for two years, and therefore my sanity has been increasing. Uh, I've done stakeholder assessments with the universities, Boise State, Idaho State, U of I. Did some interesting consulting work for Alberta province about 10 years ago. And when a couple of us took a course with Boise State, a few years back on energy policy, we wrote, a group of us wrote a paper, Energy in the Mountain West, Colonization and Independence. And essentially this talk is an update of that. Why do I say colonization? We do not control our own destiny in Idaho. This is a book published in 1980. It's a great book, still is. I see at least one person has read it. Its basic idea is that if you want to understand North America, forget state boundaries. Imagine that we have nine nations in North America. Over on the left coast, Ecotopia, parts of California all the way up to Alaska. New England, which goes up into Canada. Dixie, the islands. As a southerner, I will confirm that southern Florida is not part of Dixie, <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. We live in what's called the empty quarter, where there are not many people and a lot of resources, except in Idaho. The point is, where do the people live? On the coast. Where do we live? Empty quarter. 
Who has more votes? The coast. The coast do. Push comes to shove, we lose. Even worse, this map shows where the federal government owns land. Look at Idaho. Nevada, Nevada, Idaho, and Alaska, which I didn't bother putting on here, are the most owned by the federal government. Federal government controls that land. And that turns out to be relevant. That turns out to be what? Relevant. <laughs> now, we get into energy some. On the left side, I've listed a variety of energy sources. And across the top, how we use energy. And the main categories are transportation, for example, how you got here today, heat, heat for businesses, for homes, for industry, for making things, such as all those nice things that we take camping, and finally electricity. <clears throat> A fundamental concern and challenge in the energy business is that the transportation box or col column only has one real X and that's oil. All these things in the bottom half, they can only contribute to transportation to the extent that we figure out how to electrify transportation. <coughs> There's also synthetic fuels and so forth, but people put a lot of time, money, and effort into those. They may or may not come. So this, this is a fundamental limitation that we have to contend with. Already I've shown you some complexity. It's going to get worse. That means if anyone tells you they've got a simple answer to the energy <coughs> conundrum, don't stay anywhere near them. Turn on your heels and run as fast as you can from them because they're trying to fool you. There's absolutely nothing about the energy situation that is simple. So bear with me, there's some complexity here, but I want to help you answer those children and grandchildren who are convinced they know more about energy than you do. Well, we don't have any coal to speak of. We've, there's a whole lot of coal down uh, the, uh, the U.S., actually going up into Canada, a bit uh, east of us, a lot of coal back east, but you don't see a lot of nice colors in Idaho. We do import some electricity made from coal. This is probably the closest coal plant to Idaho Falls. It's in Utah, and it's located at the mouth of a coal mine. Oil fields. You see any nice pretty green dots in Idaho? No. Or uh, gas fields. See any nice red and pink dots in Idaho? No. Now, I was told this morning by a friend, Joel Hubble, that there's actually been some found on the Oregon-Idaho border. Now this this map, which I just downloaded, it's the most, it's 2009, it's the last time the federal government has updated this map. It's a little strange. But you can see all the places in the U.S. that have gas. So I've just told you, coal, oil, gas, and Idaho has little or none. We don't have uranium to speak of, at least not to the extent that we've looked in all of these things. Remember, a good fraction of Idaho is controlled by the federal government. It's not totally clear how well we know what's there. We import a little bit of nuclear power. This is the closest nuclear energy plant to Idaho Falls. It's in uh, Washington State. One of my former students uh, works there. He, uh, he enjoys it. Another consideration we have. We live in a really dry place. And in case you forget that, go visit the East Coast in various parts of the, of the uh, country, I mean, uh, of the year. I come from the Carolinas. I know what the word hurricane means. 
I know what a drenching rain means. I'm not sure that either word ever comes into the lexicon of Idahoans. We're a dry place. You see that little, little uh, place uh, in the middle of Idaho, around the eastern part of Idaho? That's us. We're in a dry state and the driest part of the state. Lucky us. We have dams in Idaho. This is the largest dam in the state. It's on the Oregon border, the Brownlee Dam. Biomass, wood, corn, other things. Strangely enough, most of the biomass potential is where there's precipitation. So we do not too bad, but we're certainly not the Saudi Arabia of biomass. We do have wind. We've all felt it. Note, however, the Snake River Plain. We have a lot of wind potential on the sides of the plain, but not in the plain itself. According to NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. <clears throat> How many of you gone up close to one of the windmills we have east of town? Would you describe them as big, huge, humongous? I've seen them go, go right through the middle of town. And you know, it's out one side of downtown before the other end of the things, uh, even in town. These things are humongous. 20 stories. And they're not getting smaller. We'll talk more about that wind farm pretty quick. We have solar, believe it or not. <laughs> Some days I wonder. We have geothermal. We do have a, for example, a Raft River ge geothermal plant down uh, southwest of here. That's, that's a picture of it. These are cooling towers. So the last year I could find information on all the sources of energy in Idaho, used in Idaho. And of course it's not in a nice form. I had to do some w looking at the data. This is what I came up with. We import a lot of electricity, which I'll say more about. Natural gas, hydroelectric. So these are all things that we're using in Idaho. I, for one, was surprised that we actually use more gasoline, or less gasoline, rather, than natural gas. I did not know that. Here is the same information, but I've blacked out all the stuff we import into the state of Idaho. Okay? In the state, we generate electricity with hydro, we generate electricity with wind, we do a little bit of biomass, everything else comes from someplace else. If you remember one of my earlier slides showed where the population and therefore voters are, well, looking long term, I submit that it's not really a good strategy for Idaho if all the voters that control natural resources and those natural resources are outside the state. One question, sir. Shoot. You say energy, are you talking about energy services or just raw? Everything. Heat energy. Okay. Everything. We'll get your electricity later. This is this is usable use used energy. So services. Yeah, services. We import all of our transportation energy. We <coughs> import all of our industrial heat. And we import about a third of our electricity. We are an energy pauper surrounded by energy princes. Not a good place to be. This is a graph for the last 14 years of what fraction or percent of our electricity does Idaho import. You know, we did relatively good in 2011. We imported less than 30 percent. As I'll show you later, that's because that was a good year for hydro in our state. 
overall, compared to the other states, there's only three states worse than us. By the way, in 2006, when we were taking this class, we were the worst state in this perspective. So Massachusetts is a bit worse, Maryland's a bit worse. Vermont imports 62% of its electricity. Just out of curiosity, you know, I keep hearing that all these windmills are dedicated to California. So the wind percentage that you shared with us, does that include the stuff that's dedicated for out of state? Everything, that, everything's net. So we actually import more electricity than this, but it's counterbalanced by electricity that we sell. So if it's dedicated to some other state, we, we just lost that? Well, it, I mean, we lost it, in from fact. From Idaho's portion. Uh, and, and that's actually not bad, and I'll show you why. Now, Vermont 62, I looked at that and I said, gee, that looks strange. Well, it happens that December, this is 2015 data, December 2014, Vermont, in their infinite wisdom, shut down the Yankee nuclear power plant. Prior to that, they were an exporter of electricity. But as some of our politicians want to do, they shut it down. And now they're the worst state in terms of sucking electricity from other states. Here's something important to your, so your question. This is the average electricity price 2015 in the western states. Idaho's 8.1. Only two states are lower, Washington and Wyoming. Ten years ago, if I had shown you that graph, we were the lowest. But as we don't control our destiny, our prices are going to go up. Now, California has the highest. So back to your point, it's actually advantageous from a utility perspective to sell expensive power, wind is expensive, to sell it to the Californians and then buy cheaper power from other places. That's a win. Now, let the Californians have the expensive stuff. And they do. This is what percent either import or export each state is in 2015. California is the giant sucking sound of electricity. Now, they import a smaller fraction than we do, but they're a lot, lot bigger consumer. So it's a lot more electricity flowing into California than flowing into Idaho. California, of course, will suck into it anything the rest of us let. Electricity, water, tax money, whatever. You name it, they'll take it. But we're not helping matters. I hate to say it, but thank God for Wyoming. They, they save our bacon. So be nice to Wyoming the next time you're over there. Okay, this is the electricity generated in the state of Idaho, whether we keep it or sell it to California or any place else. Hydroelectric goes up and down. I mentioned 2011. It's a bit higher. Again, that was a good year from this perspective. Wind has slowly been increasing. Natural gas goes up and down. Then we have a bunch of other things that are little pieces. We actually get electricity from burning wood in Idaho. That's at some of the uh, so-called co-generation sites. Waste wood, waste uh, other biomass. Geothermal, you don't even see here. Coal, all these other things, you don't even see. Basically, Idaho is getting its electricity from hydroelectric, wind, natural gas. Now, I promised you this would be complex. Well, here I'm going to pay off on the promise a bit. <coughs> As if I already have it. On the left are all kinds of energy sources that we use in this country and around the world to make electricity. The ones that are over here all have the same characteristic, which is we use them to make heat. The heat heats up. Fluid, typically, but not always water. 
Sometimes it's a molten salt, and will be if Daryl has his way. <coughs> Use that hot fluid to turn a turbine. Now, wind and hydro skip all this. And they also turn a turbine, but it's more direct because the fluid, the air, the water is turning the turbine, which these things have to go through a step to get here. You turn a turbine that makes electricity, solar voltaic directly can make electricity. These differences become important when you get into the engineering. Some other things that are important that are very typically ignored when people give you sound bites about, sign, sound bites about energy. Think in terms of energy sources for electricity that are at nature's mercy. Nature's even less forgiving than those voters on the east and west coast. Energy sources, electricity tr sources that can follow the load and then those that are base load. Now what do I mean by that? We don't use electricity at the same level all day long. We have energy sources that do this and we have energy or electricity needs that do this during the year. How many of you use electricity to heat your homes? Okay, You're probably heating your homes more in the winter than in the summer. Some days you're not so sure because it's Idaho. We have fluctuations during the week. Each day, day, night, when the Super Bowl turns on and off. All of these things cause fluctuations in the need for electricity. Well that means that the, fee the folks that give us those ele uh, uh, electricity sources have to turn on and off sources to give us what we need, at least what we think we need. So any electrical grid has to contend with that. So we have energy sources, electricity sources that are pretty, pretty good for giving us that kind of constant foundation. Wind and solar are, are at nature's mercy. People will tell you otherwise, but they're bullshitting you. <laughs> and they're undoubtedly selling you some of this. <laughs> <coughs> then you have load following which makes up the difference between what nature gives, what this gives, and what we want. An electric grid needs something in each category. Now I've broken these two columns, fuel and capital. By fuel I mean energy, electricity sources, where the cost is dominated by the cost of the fuel itself. Oil, for example, costs money. The power plant that burns oil to produce electricity, we don't have many of them left in the US, that plant's not too expensive. On the right hand are the options where the fuel is either low or zero cost. That doesn't mean the electricity is free. It means instead what's happened is in, in those cases, the economics is driven by the cost of the plant cost of the windmill, the cost of the nuclear plant. Again, if someone tells you there's a single answer to any of this stuff, check your wallet, your purse, your man bag, whatever it might be, and run to the hills. I submit from an Idaho perspective, since we don't have any of those fields, Energy sources, electricity sources, that require expensive fuels that we're importing into Idaho, every time you fill up your car, every time you get natural gas, you're just sending money outside the state of Idaho. Just, there goes. When we build plants in Idaho, on that right side, be it windmill, be it nuclear, we're bringing investment and therefore dollars into the state of Idaho and to some degree jobs depending on where the components are made. Now if I was giving this talk in Wyoming I wouldn't have this slide. 
because the situation looks different in different places. But we're Idahoans. So as we look forward for the state of Idaho, I submit the options in green deserve more attention. The ones in the middle, we'd like to do without, or at least minimize. Well, one of the things on the right side is nuclear. I'm a nuclear engineer. It's a very established technology. You take uranium, that's uranium oxide here. You make it into little pellets the size of the, up to the first joint of your finger. Those are put into rods, into boxes, and put into power plants. We know how to do it. 19% of all the electricity in the United States comes from this technology. It's established, we know how to do it. We have an issue in the United States, and specifically in Idaho, whether the next set of power plants of the nuclear type are going to be small or large. Some of you have heard that there is a site use agreement that DOE signed for the Idaho National Laboratory that will allow, under various detailed conditions that only a lawyer would love, allow the site to be used to test new small module reactors, SMRs. Of course, we have to have an acronym. Well, that's good because that might be the future. Some, will, some people will say yes, some people will say no. I will tell you, I don't know. Economies of scale, regulatory experience, industry experience, these are big things. <laughs> Only a few of the buttons over here, a few of the lines here, but they are very, very important. Over here, we'll see. So you'll see in the coming weeks and months, years, more about new scale. That's probably the outfit that would first build a small module reactor here in eastern Idaho. I hope there'll be more. And one of the reasons is what I'll come to next. So this is a debate that will be starting up. And now you're ready for it. The power plant new scale that I just mentioned, and all the power plants in the United States now, nuclear power plants, all use what's called the once through or throw away fuel cycle. Fuel gets put in, it gets taken out, and it goes into storage. It works. But did you know that 95% of the material in those fuel rods, when it comes out of the reactor, is recyclable? 95%. Even more important, that's the nastiest stuff in the waste. Now, this is a little, little tricky here. On this side is the toxicity of the material in the used fuel relative to the toxicity of uranium ore that you start with. Uranium ore is toxic. Across the bottom, the number of years after the fuel comes out of the reactor. Well, when the fuel comes out of the reactor, it's screaming hot, radiologically hot, toxic. Over time, it cools off, like anything that's radioactive. Well, at long times, it's uranium and the trans, so-called transuranics that dominate the toxicity of that material. In other words, way out in here, it's exactly the stuff that is recyclable that makes it toxic. If we take that stuff out of the waste, put it back into appropriate reactors, and use it, then instead of the material staying more toxic than uranium ore for, ten, or for hundreds of thousands of years, it's thousands of years. Still a long time, but a whole lot easier problem. If we take out cesium and strontium, put that in a separate storage location, now we're down into the hundreds of years. So by recycling, we not only get more resource, we also address the waste problem. It costs money, it makes some people nervous, therefore we're not doing it yet, but in the future we will. And this is one of the reasons why. Energy sources are finite. We can increase the uranium resource effectively by 
multiple million times by recycling. We'll use the resource itself and we can move from conventional uranium all the way down to poor grade ore phosphates. By the way, Idaho does have phosphates. So, yeah, Don. It's not very usable now, but as you get more energy out of that material by recycling, then you can go to lower and lower grades economically. So we will eventually recycle. When? I don't know, but we will. Leaving nuclear aside, now we'll get to wind and solar. Another one of those truisms, the next time someone tells you that option X solves all problems, tell them you know that there's a subsidy with whatever that option is. All energy options have subsidies. You can like it, you can not like it, tell your Congress critters, but all options have subsidies. They're lowest for coal, hydro, nuclear, oil and natural gas. This is US uh, DOE information, by the way. Then we go up for biomass, wind. Well, that's 35 versus, say, hydro at less than one. And solar is even worse than that. So they all have subsidies, but some of them are a lot bigger than others. Is that a subsidy on the capital investment or it, some, some this, some that. They've incorporated all of that into here in terms of the, the price of the electricity. So, so all that capital in a, in a hydroelectric dam is already included in that $1 or something? Yeah, again, this is not the cost of the electricity. This is the so subsidies right. for it. So these are pretty small. And I think what's incorporated in some of this is the investment in the past. I can't tell you all the details. The biggies are over here because they're the politically popular ones. Again, back to that map I showed you up the front. Where are the voters? What do they want? So if we uh, look 30 years down the road, those numbers are going to drop for wind and solar. Or taxes will go up. Okay. I mean, there's only two options. There is an initial investment, and that is certainly subsidized. But as you go on, if those devices work for 20 years, and you're averaging the cost over that period of time, those numbers have to drop. Did everyone hear what Bob said? Now he's talking about when the current windmills go off service. Let me pull that thread a minute with you, Bob. Those of us who are in the nuclear power business know that every nuclear power plant in the U.S. during its period of operation, by law and with lots of regulatory oversight, has to put money aside year after year so that when those plants reach the end of their life, there's money set aside for them to be decommissioned. It's not held by the federal government. It's not held by the state government. It's held in unbreakable trusts. And we know it's unbreakable because both the states of California and South Carolina have conducted trust rating parties where they went after money set aside for decommissioning, dismantlement of nuclear power plants. And the money was kept away from the politicians. My question to you is, do we do that for any other energy option? No. We got a lot of windmills east of town. I'll show you just how many in a minute. I'll wager you a bit of money that there is lawsuits in the future for at least some of those windmills. Because one of them is going to break down, or a whole bunch of them is going to break down. It won't be economic to repair. And suddenly, people will discover that the windmill had been sold to somebody else. 
And the farmer who's been getting money by having it on his land for all those years is going to be out of luck. I would have said something else, but it's a nice, nice group here. And they're going to be ticked off. And they're going to get their lawyers. Everyone's going to have their lawyers. You see, this is what happened, if you may remember Love Canal and some of the Superfund sites, where, yeah, everyone said, well, people will clean up their own messes. Sure, we can count on them. And then all these corporations suddenly found a way to walk away. I'll make the bold prediction that this is going to happen to windmills. First time I was in Hawaii, at the southernmost part of the United States, I saw some abandoned windmills as you're driving out to that point, and they creaked in the wind with yucky something streaming down the sides of those windmills. Sure. I'm just curious, who had the foresight to do that with Ms. Willie Powell? Such a money is too much. He's saving the money for replacements. That is a good question. Jerry, any idea? I couldn't hear. Who set up, whose idea was it to have those trust funds for nuclear power plant decommissioning? Atomic Energy Commission, which is what we had before DOE. Back when it was run by people who knew what they were doing because they were technical people and not politicians. The old Atomic Energy Commission was run by technical people. The Department of Energy is run by politicians. There's a difference. What's the dollar magnitude of the trust? It depends on the plant and what it's been estimated to cost to undo. Hundreds of millions of dollars per plant. Per plant. So it's at it, that level now. Yeah. Well, and again, it depends on each plant. It's got its own situation. But there are reports on, this, on the web. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has all kinds of very elaborate rules on how this is all done so that it is safe from budget rating por parties and that there is enough money. So it's not just guesswork. I mean, there's a lot of e effort put into it. Do you have a chart that shows the true cost of all the energy sources um, without the subsidies? Like, how does, no. how does solar rate to coal if there are no subsidies? Like, which is more expensive? I'll give you a clue in a minute. I don't have the exact answer, but I'll give you a clue in a minute. So... Can I ask something? Sure, absolutely. Uh, any new technology, I mean, many new so that's right. Technology can be introduced. That's right. And so that's what we're so seeing right now. So over time, that probably will drop to a much lower level than it is now. It might. It might. Of course, none of us know for sure in the future. I have noticed, however, over the years, 20, 30 years, subsidies were more readily turned off throughout society, whether it's energy or anything else. Now, anytime there's a subsidy for anything, I don't care what it is, there's a big, big, big lobby that builds up around it. And the subsidies don't seem to be going away very fast. They might. I hope you're right. Some things with wind we care about in Idaho. Here we're putting antifreeze of some sort, de-icing, if you will, one of those monstrous windmills. Now, if this was my farm underneath all that, I might not be super happy. See, I've, I was a pilot a long time ago, and I know that if you have any imbalance in a rapidly turning set of propellers, you have big trouble. They can't afford ice buildup on these things. So if they stop in the wrong conditions, they stay stopped until you can do this or something else to get the ice off. Installation of wind in the United States for the last 10 years. This tells us a couple of things. Number one, in green, the amount of wind capacity installed manufactured in the United States. It's General Electric 
does 100% of the, essentially 100% of the windmills in the United States. Uh, Europe, that's Denmark, Germany, primarily, some, in, some from Spain actually. India, Japan, and then some, some itty bitty others. The good news here, look at the last year for which there's data, 60% of the windmills installed in the United States, windmill capacity, were made in the United States. That actually surprised me. There's some other things here. If you go on web and you look at high level, more policy level documents for wind, they generally quote 2012, which just happens to be the peak year in terms of wind installation. I can't imagine why. And the question about cost. Getting a real honest answer on cost is not easy. You can go to three different websites and get three different answers. But this is what the marketplace tells you. 2013, beginning of 2013, it was right after an election, and we had not, Congress and the President had not renewed the subsidy on wind in the United States, or solar for that matter. And look what happened to wind installations the following year. So the market is telling us that without subsidies, we're not going to build much. First Robin and then over here. Because she's my wife and therefore <laughs> I pay attention to her. How come the investment in wind turbine installations vary the same over the whole world? If it went up in the United States, it went up in Europe and India and Japan and others. And uh, it went down in the U.S., it went down in everything else. These are all U.S. installations with windmills purchased from all these places. So this is only the U.S. market. Uh, uh, my question is because it says 1,000 megawatt installed, but whatever is installed, is that be, having been in, installed in certain years, or are we looking at... Installed in that year. Uh, New installations each year. You threw off 60% again, as you say that statistic again. Here, 2014, if you look at this sideways, green, windmills manufactured in the United States are about 60% of all the windmills that were installed in 2014. In the back. Have we already got most of the windiest sites already uh, located with uh, windmills? I don't think so, but this may be someone in the room. Russ, you may know better than I on that subject. He says no, and I trust him. The convenient ones. The convenient ones. Yeah. <laughs> There's lots of windy places where it's so far away. That sure. Your previous graph. Yeah. Which one? Can you show it again? No, no, the one, that one. Yeah. If we had to eliminate the use of coal, oil, and natural gas. How would the analysis look? I don't know because a <laughs> risk dimension, a third dimension of risk. If we eliminate those, the market gets more complicated. Are all the microphones other than my camera turned off? <laughs> If we had to do that in a crash course, yes. which is, I, and I, I think I know why you're asking the question. He's asking, what, what happens if we had to get rid of the fossil fuels? From an Idaho perspective, I would close the borders <laughs> after we get a couple of nuclear power plants, if we could possibly get them in the state. Then I'd close the borders, I'd keep out the Californians, I'd say, thank you, Wyoming, but too bad, and I'd run the state without fossil fuels. Who would we make pay for the wall we build around Idaho? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, and I'm not going to touch that one. In the back. <laughs> yep. That I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. Do you happen to know? I 
know when I go up in that area above uh, you know, the island where I have a fall, it's kind of like a, almost like a giant industrial site. So but although I'm, I'm making fun of wind, it's still necessary. And, I, and, and right now, we should not be in the business of throwing away options. Especially not when we're energy paupers. So you can see the market goes up, the US market goes up and down. And it's not because the need for electricity does this. It's because the political environment is going up and down. Wind energy, like it or not, is driven by politics. Now, back to Idaho. It's a little fuzzy because I'm focusing a bit more on Idaho. Of course, all this is public lands with some of the uh, various valleys going up into central Idaho. Guess what? All the all the best land up in this area, wind-wise, is state or federal owned, just as you were saying. To my surprise, when I looked at the numbers, and again, this was not easy to find. You have to look real hard to find out most of the statistics on wind. And as an old safety engineer, I get real suspicious any time I have to look hard for information. I'm sorry, but that's the case. If someone is forthcoming with the information, they'd have nothing to hide. Well, other than a little test turbine here, all the wind turbines in the, United, in the in state of Idaho are right along the snake and along the interstate. 38% of the installed capacity is what we see east of town. Now, when people in Boise tell you we need more wind, they ain't got any. And when people in Sun Valley tell you we need more wind, they ain't got any. And when the folks in Jackson don't like us having a nuclear power plant and you ask them if they have any wind, the answer is no, they don't. Like it or not, this is where the wind is now. Where it will go in the future, I don't know. But this is where it is today. Okay. Now, of course, it's mostly federal land, but not all. There's no windmills up in here, and there's a lot of windy places. There's a little bit right there. There's none in northern Idaho, which really surprised me. It's in, the, in our state, it's all here. Of course, if you've been on I-80 in Wyoming, <laughs> you know they have a fair amount of this, this thing called wind. There's also a little bit down here in the corner. Lots over here. So there's, if you compare that and this, there are other places that are not state and federal owned where there is a wind resource. May not be convenient, but the options are there. You look like you've cut the coast off. Uh, I presume there's none over there along the coast in Oregon and Washington. There's some here, not so much. There's, there's, you, it's hard to tell in this graph. That this is kind of deep blue right along the coast. It's not much on the coast. On the, around Chicago, Michigan, by the way, the best sites are in the middle of Lake Michigan and in the middle of other lakes, not so much on the shore. Uh, on the east coast, some of the best sites are offshore, which is why there's all this fuss a couple of years ago about wind installations off uh, Cape Cod. Uh, I don't know too many people who like looking at windmills, okay? But we get to. It turns out we have four wind farms east of us. They have different owners. They really are four wind, wind facilities. They all have different owners. They all have different operators. They were put up at different times, which frankly I did not realize until I, I did my homework for this. Together, it's 366 megawatts of capacity. 
which is why we're 38% of the state. You can't see a lot of them from town. Here's Idaho Falls. So this is a satellite image. So we see what's along the ridge, but there's all lots back in here. Now, capacity is not the same thing as power. Capacity is how much any type of electricity source can produce if it's running 100%. Well, no power source runs 100%. A real, the real comparison is power, in which case you have to factor in what fraction of time or percent of time that capacity is being used. Well, we have four dams owned and run by Idaho Falls Power. There was a time it was producing more than 50% of the electricity needed by the city. The city has grown. The Idaho Falls Power website says that they pr together produce about 30%. They give about 25 megawatts as the amount of power produced. Working backwards, that means the capacity factor is a little more than half. Yes, Robin? So why would they only run the dams 53% of the time? Why don't they run them 100% of the time? They may not always need the power, and they may not have the water. There are parts of the year where you don't see any water going over the dams. And if you don't have enough water behind the dams, you can't just push the water through the turbines. Windmills, those four wind farms that I just mentioned, 25%, maybe, maybe higher. That produces around 92 megawatts uh, a year. If we could use that, which we can't for a variety of reasons, including the fact that the needs of electricity do this, and the fact we don't own it, but it's enough electricity spread over the year to meet the city of Idaho Falls needs. Are you guessing because that 25% because they won't tell you? Yes. Okay. In Germany, you can get statistics like that. It is not easy. You have to be a better sleuth than I am to find it. I can't answer that. I simply don't know. And I, I mean, somebody knows this, and somebody who's better at digging out the information could probably find it. When you say percent of Idaho Falls needs, is that just who's being served by Idaho Falls Power? Idaho Falls Power. Okay, so like I live south of town, I got Rocky Mountain Power. And is just Anna included in that, or some of the other surrounding areas? If, are you on Idaho Falls Power? No, we're on Rocky Mountain. Then you don't count on this graph. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's really a Yep. I can really condensed it. Right. <laughs> right. Don. So you're saying that those 366 windmills produce about the same as a 100 megawatt nuclear plant running its typical um, yep. capacity Right. Or two of these new scale modules. In the backyard, right? Yeah. So this new scale business I mentioned before, they're slated at 50 megawatts. U.S. pressurized water reactor experience suggests they were run for about 90% of the time, maybe 92. That's actually fleet average now. So that's roughly not 45. That's half. So two of these modules, in terms of power, again, ignoring ups and downs and all those nice details that, that make engineers happy, all of, the, all of these is equal to roughly two of these new scale units. I have a question for you. New sure thing. Oregon company, right? Yes. Why will they be supposedly, my understanding is they're going to be built at INL, is that right? That's Why? the hope of many people, myself included. Why? Why? I think politically it's easier to cite a nuclear power plant in the state of Idaho exactly. than the state of Oregon. It's not an issue. You can build them anywhere. I mean, others. I mean, we we have the need for it. You saw that Oregon is is selling power to other states, whereas we're sucking it in. So the market's here. I'm not talking about installing. Yeah. Manufacturing. The different places around the country will make the components, and I don't know the whole supply chain. It's a good question, but I don't. I some I don't know if I do not know if that's all been. Uh, 
determined yet. What's the footprint of a module? I don't have a good number, so I'm not going to make one up, but they're pretty small. Any, any power plant other than solar, photovoltaic, hydro, and wind have to have some way, t because of thermodynamics, of rejecting heat to the environment. So the answer is yes, as it is for almost everything else. Does not have to be water. Water's the cheapest. And that's important from an Idaho perspective because we know we're not exactly blessed with infinite amount of water in this state. So, and what water would they use? They would have to get water rights, and they'd, if it's on the INL site, which doesn't have any rivers, they'll have to be pumping it up. Okay. I don't know if everyone heard that. So in Idaho, we have water rights. Senior senator in Washington from uh, the state of Idaho, of course, Mike Crapo, made his career in water regulation, water rights, water law. And so the site does have a water right. Only, last time I checked, about 10% of the Idaho labs water right is actually being used. So if an agreement were made between New Scale and DOE, yes, that would happen. But that's the specific, the water right for the, the lab is specific for nuclear research and reactors. Okay. It's got, it's got, it's, you, we got in trouble because <laughs> we allowed razors to use water that the site had pumped. And the legal aspect was that if you allowed razors to uh, feed their, their flock, you were misused. Feed that water right. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. I, that, you, you taught me something. So this puts some of it in perspective. Solar, we can do it. However, it's not going to amount to much if we're realistic. There's an interesting graphic I came across last year. A single nuclear power installation, Diablo Canyon, uh, near Santa Barbara, California, produces more than twice the electricity of all the solar panels in the state of California. So you see a whole lot of panels here and there, but they don't, in the big scheme of things, they don't produce a lot of electricity. So here's what I suggest might be Idaho's future, if we're lucky. Baseload nuclear, which we are not doing now in this state, Wind, hey, let's take those federal subsidies. Bob, you may be right. They may go down. Let's, let's get them. <laughs> Sorry, but it's free money. I don't like it, but it's there. For, for wind, there is, and solar, actually, for both, there's also the new technology that is kind of being developed of, of having batteries yes. to store and, and make more of a base of production. Man makes a good point that batteries are being developed. The battery technology is always getting better, which is why I drive a hybrid car. And we may be able to l even out this problem with more and more battery technology. The batteries will cost money. Something will have to be mined and manufactured, all of which will itself take it electricity to do. Look like you had a question back there? No. So we need to do nuclear, we need to do wind, and then this load following problem. Now this problem actually gets worse the more of this we use. Well, we can use biomass, some in, in this state. We'll have to use natural gas to make up some of the, the difference. We're not going to really add all that much to hydro in this state. But we should be using less hydro down here, which is why, where nuclear comes in, and leave the hydro here for load following purposes. Hydro is a good way for load following. So it's, this is a, an engineering nice 
combination and it's attuned to what we have or don't have in the state of Idaho. It's not just one. Yes, Daryl. A lot of our hydro though is run on the river where you really don't some, you store very much. Some. Yeah. Palisades, Brownlee, uh, and whatnot. Yeah, you have some. Those, those are all, they, they can be turned on and off at will. So it's a system. It's not a single thing. Again, anyone tells you one, one option is going to solve the problem, not going to happen. And one second, back to your point, Russ. Although my arguments are not based on climate change or global warming or whatever it is, this is fairly benign from that perspective. There's no oil, there's no coal, and there's only this to the extent we can't solve our needs over here. So it's not exactly what you might want, but it gets us in that direction. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm saying, and I can talk to you later, that it may not be an option. I, uh, we, we'll, we'll, we, Russ and I, I've, I've seen his talks. Now he's graced me with, with uh, attending one of mine. This not, talk is not on climate change, so I won't want to digress. We, someday I'll maybe give a talk. There's differences of opinion on whether climate change is driven by humans, and if so, what do we do about it? I want to make this argument robust. I get to this point independent of climate change, which might be an earth-shaking problem, and a lot of people, a lot of very sincere and smart people think it is. But I get to this point because of Idaho's characteristics. Now you were making a point about some states where solar is starting to make a dent, I think was your word. I don't want to throw away energy options. We have a problem. What can you do? Inform yourself. Don't listen to spin doctors. I would suggest that you support nuclear wind and electrification of our society. Remember that slide earlier? Most of the energy options that we have in Idaho all produce electricity. So the more society shifts to electricity instead of other things, the better it is for the state of Idaho. <laughs> Research on geothermal and solar, great. We have made, thanks to fracking, big improvements in decreasing how much dollars, how many dollars we send to the Middle East. And we want to keep that trend up. And I've promised, hmm, my wife's left the room. <coughs> I've promised my son and daughter my next car is going to be a plug-in hybrid. A, because it's cool and it's neat engineering. And B, because I want to be part of the electrification of transportation. So, just a thought. Yes. And they, the, the utility has to buy back. So I, I guess the point that I want to I want to make is that you know we rely on the utilities to service us, and all of us are looking for ways that we can reduce costs. <laughs> okay. So if you if you if you got a better voltage and you're going to put it in your place, why not? You know. So I guess what I'm saying is that there have to be there has to be some working together from a a regulation standpoint as to how this is managed as we look down in the future. Because, you know, photovoltaics are getting better and better and better. They are? All the time. We, I mean, utilities do not have an easy job. One way, perhaps, to think about this whole energy business, 
and, and I'll use an aircraft because, again, I used to be a, a small plane pilot. So imagine you're behind the stick, or in some cases, a wheel, of a small aircraft. A yoke, thank you. See, it's been a while since I've been a pilot. And, oh, by the way, it's dark outside. In fact, it's raining cats and dogs. You're having trouble seeing what's going on. And your radio just went out. And all your instruments went out. And, oh, by the way, it's not just you, the utility, trying to fly the dang thing. There's this guy from the government who's here to help you, sitting next to you. And the guy over there is the consumer who's, you know, putting demands on you. And the guy that's squeezed in over on this side is the politician in Boise or D.C. And you're all arguing over where the plane should go and you can't see squat. <laughs> that's what we face. This is not easy. By the way, the last time the state of Idaho updated its state energy plan was 2012. You can go out on the web and, and, and find it. So we do not have an easy situation. I'd love to give you a lot of really nice sugar-coated cookies. It's a tough job. All the more reason to be informed, to vote that way, to advocate that way, and to do what each of us can step by step toward that future, or if you prefer something else, your, your preference. More questions? He addressed, he addressed uh, some of the issues with the distributed generation, which means that if people start putting solar panels on their houses, there's going to be, they want to sell the power during the day when they don't use as much and produce a lot, and then at night they will draw from the, from the grid. Um, obviously that, uh, I was the committee chair for reviewing the operations for the city of Idaho Falls. For Idaho Falls. Excellent. And that is one of the big things that needs to be addressed. Is that is, at this point, there are a few people that have solar panels on their houses, and they have kind of an agreement on what they can sell the power for. Um, but the problem is that if you have 20, 30, 40 percent of the people that do that, then all of a sudden the city, uh, Idaho Falls Power, doesn't have enough money to maintain the infrastructure of the grid. And so that is something that, in the long term, 20-year strategic plan that we recommended they put together, they need to look at how they need to price the power they'll buy from you if you have the solar panels, and how much uh, you have to yep. have to pay maybe a fee, a yearly fee, to maintain the grid. Did you folks over on this side of the room hear that? This is tricky stuff. We just got back from New Zealand, and that's exactly what that kind of does. Speak, uh, speak louder so they can hear you. We just got back from New Zealand, and that's exactly what that country does. I talked to a, uh, an engineer. He stayed at his home and got it talking about energy. And he was interested in putting a public tanks on his house. So he said if he did, he'd be taxed for that. And it actually would net cost him more to actually run the solar there are parts of the world that don't have the hydro storage that we do in Idaho. Again, there's a difference between run of the river where you either take the electricity as the water is flowing or you don't versus places where you have reservoirs where you can store it. But a lot of parts of the country don't have that as an option. Europe, for example, is really full of places that don't have that as an option. They find every time they build more windmills or the few s amount of solar they have, they have to build more natural gas to be ready for when the wind's not blowing. Now, if we had you know, inexpensive batteries, that would change things. Technology can change things. We in Idaho, 
We in Idaho are fairly well off in using this because we have that. Subject to utility, you know, because Idaho Falls Power doesn't own all those windmills. It owns this. So how the money's flowing, the electricity's flowing among all these different places is part of the puzzle. Are all those windmills dedicated to California, out east of town, or does Idaho Falls get any of that power dedicated to that? I'm not aware. When I looked at the, the website, it took me a while to go through, but you have to look up each wind facility across the state to find its ownership. One of these is Exelon owned, another one is Pacificorp. Uh, so some of it might find its way back to us. If so, I don't know what the number is, and I think it's pretty small. Well, I mean, I mean the electrons, I'm not very Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's to some degree a shell game. Yeah. And, and you know, I sell electricity here, you sell it there, so forth and so on. Nonetheless, California's, w their cost of electricity is higher than ours. So if I'm selling those electrons, even if I'm, you know, shuffling them under the table somehow, I'd much rather sell to California than to Idaho Falls. I mean, I'm going to go where the price is higher. Daryl. <laughs> I did it 10 years ago. I raised hell even while I was still working for him. But I found, as far as I can tell, the site still isn't really seriously looking into sustainable nuclear power since they dropped the IFR. <coughs> Are they really looking at reactors with burn essentially all the act tonight, or are they not? I can't New speak. New scale won't do it. New scale will not do it. Now, its fuel could be recycled could like it could be but it's not optimized in that regard. I'm two years out of date, so I can't honestly answer that question. But recycle means different things. Yes, it does. Putting it back in the same kind of reactor doesn't really solve it. Hopefully this fellow is going to answer your, your question. Um, I don't think it's well, the United States, and obviously I now is looking at that, they don't have a lot of them. They didn't get fully funded to go very fast. We're doing a lot of active research. But South Korea and China are both heavily involved in recycling. They're really trying to push that to get better utilization of that. I know we're actually working with those countries from the United States. Recycling, I mean, putting it back in some kind of reactors. Back in the fuel. Right. Yeah, recycling the fuel and put back. That's why MOS facilities really don't make much sense. Right. I mean, if you and I were setting policy, which probably is a good thing we're not we would be looking at more aggressively other reactors that are, I'm going to say, optimized for recycling and for sustainability. Yeah, uh, I mean, we make these huge investments, usually through DOE, and they turn into giant boondoggles. <coughs> and the huge MOX facility on Savannah River is another one of these black holes money comes into and can create something that nobody wants. You had a question back there? No, we just can't hear it back OK. Yeah. Daryl, I mean, that's, that's as good an invite as you're going to get. I mean, <laughs> I'm just frustrated. he's frustrated with the Department of Energy. Let's, let's leave it at that. And, and I think there's other people in the room that share that fundamental frustration. Any other questions? Last question. Nobody has mentioned, and it should be a cost of nuclear. And it should be a cost because it's going to last a hundred thousand years. Why? Waste. Why? What does? What? Well, actually, I did mention it. Yeah. That right there. Yeah. yeah. Every time you generate electricity with nuclear power, not only does some of the money get put aside into a trust fund for decommissioning the plant. Other money goes to the federal government, unfortunately not a trust fund, <laughs> to deal with used nuclear fuel. The government has been collecting that money <coughs> for decades and has spent none of it. Well, it's studied 
it's, it's, it, well, it's done Yucca Mountain, but I think that was done with yearly appropriations. Because the politicians, here's, here's, sorry, here's politics again. Senator Reid from Nevada did not want to use the, well, course, the money because he wanted yearly control over the expenditures as a way to kill the Yucca Mountain repository. So the money is being collected, whether it's enough to reopen Yucca Mountain or do something else, I, you can get different opinions on that. But in the meantime, the problem is not solved. It is solved to the extent the politicians want to solve it. Trans-scientific. Trans-scientific. I like that phrase. But it's, it's, it's a problem. It's a problem. Anything else? Well, then, thank you. Drive home safely. Yes. On demand, water yes. heater, and all the uh, solar panels and everything. And I found a wind turbine. <laughs> Jay Leno has installed it in his 40,000 square foot car garage. Oh. And it runs specifically off of that turbine. No tap on the LA. And uh, Ed Bagley put one in a, he runs a commercial. And <laughs> yes. Ed Bagley put in a uh, residential one. And he went off the grid. I looked into it, and I wanted to put, I was looking at putting one in on the house. But the Bonneville County, in order to put a wind turbine on your house, you have to have two acres, because they don't want everybody to have a propeller sitting at every single little residential house. But this one is small enough, and it will generate off of a five mile an hour wind, which is an everyday Idaho day. <laughs> and you, you know, you could get off the grid, but they would. They said you couldn't do it because I don't have two acres. You don't have two acres. Even though when I would put it on the side of my house, most likely even the people from the front of the street would not see it. But even the people from the back, if I put it strategically, would not see it either. And that's a Bonneville County. It's, it's not the city. It's the county. It was the county that said anywhere in Bonneville County, you sort of put a wind. In. Had to have two acres. So that was frustrating to me. One we've talked about it, but we've never no, done it's, it. It's done like your a research. Barrel. It's like it's like putting yeah. something like this that spins. Spins this way. Yeah. Thank you.